I was invited to talk to you about the future of public health. For me, the future of public health is intimately tied up with the social determinants of health. Of course, public health involves control of communicable diseases, of immunization, of making sure people get access to health services, and others, no doubt, would take that line. But for me, focusing on the social determinants of health has to be absolutely central and linked to this focus on the social determinants of health is an abiding concern with the fair distribution of health equity. And so I've called this Fair Society Healthy Lives. Indeed, it was the title that I gave to the English Review of Health Inequalities that I was asked to lead because it was a statement that if we put fairness at the heart of all policy making, health would improve and health inequalities would diminish. So what do I mean by a fair society? We could say that health is a measure of how well we are doing as a society and the fair distribution of health is an even better measure. As a doctor, I'm concerned with health outcomes and avoidable social inequalities in health that are judged to be avoidable by reasonable means are unfair. Therefore, any actions that retard progress to reduction of these avoidable health inequalities are unfair. And by health inequalities, I don't mean only the poor health of the poor, but as I'll show you in a moment, the whole social gradient in health. When we began the Commission on Social Determinants of Health, set up by the WHO, we drew attention to figures like these. This graph shows life expectancy for men in selected countries. Life expectancy for men in Sierra Leone is under 40. In Iceland, it's 80. For women, the lowest is 42 in Zimbabwe, 86 in Japan, a 44-year difference in life expectancy across the world. I was keen to make the case that health inequalities are not confined simply to poor health in poor countries and reasonable health everywhere else. You can see that the differences in health among countries are graded, but also we have huge inequalities within rich countries. And we drew attention to life expectancy for men in Glasgow. In the poorest part of Glasgow, life expectancy for men is 54. In the richest part of Glasgow, it's 28 years longer at 82. So you can see that the inequalities are so big within one rich country such as the United Kingdom that indeed they overlap with the differences among country. Life expectancy for men in the poorest part of Glasgow is shorter than the average in India, for example. So we're dealing with inequalities both within and between countries, shown here for infant mortality by mother's education. The top part of this graph, in each case the top of the bars, shows the infant mortality for mothers with no education and below the infant mortality of babies born to mothers with secondary or higher education. And in each of these countries you can see the huge gap in infant mortality depending on the education of mother. But secondly, you can see the big differences among countries. So that, for example, a mother with secondary education in a country such as Congo has a baby with a better chance of surviving than the average in countries at this end of the scale. So huge differences within and between countries. But, as I said, health inequalities are not confined 
simply to poor health amongst the poorest, but follow a social gradient. These data on under five mortality by quintiles of wealth come from the demographic and health surveys. And you can see for Uganda, India, Turkmenistan, Peru, Morocco, that it's not just people at the bottom who have children with a higher risk of dying before the age of five, but it's socially graded. And it means that we should be focusing not just on the bottom quintile, but in Peru, what about the second quintile from the bottom? In fact, what about the middle quintile or the second from the top? And the implication of the gradient is that we should be focusing on the whole of society, not simply the worst off. These data come from the Review of Health Inequalities that I conducted in England called Fair Society, Healthy Lives, or the Marmot Review. And the top graph shows life expectancy. Each point on this graph represents a neighborhood, a small area of England classified by level of income deprivation. So at the right hand end, we have the least deprived, the most affluent, and at the other end, we have the most deprived. There is a difference between, let's say, the fifth centile, the most deprived, and the 95th centile of seven years in life expectancy. But the drama of this graph is not the difference between top and bottom, but the fact that people in the middle have shorter life expectancy than those near the top, and those near the top have shorter life expectancy than those at the top. It's a gradient the whole way from top to bottom. The bottom graph is disability-free life expectancy. The gradient is steeper. The gap between the fifth and the 95th centile is now not seven years, but 17 years. And the implication of the gradient is that we have to take action across the whole of society. Now, I said the gap in life expectancy between the fifth and the 95th centile is seven years, <clears throat> but we can find smaller areas with much bigger differences. This is a map of London, one area of London, Tottenham Green, up here in the northeast. Life expectancy for men is 71 in the rather fancy, posh, high-income area of Queensgate Ward in Kensington and Chelsea, life expectancy for men, 88. A 17-year gap in life expectancy. I could cycle that on my bicycle in about 60 minutes. Not just London. These data come from Porto Alegre and show the gradient socioeconomic level of districts, high, medium high, medium low, low. And you can see this gradient in CVD deaths. In fact, it was estimated that 45% of all premature CVD deaths in Porto Alegre are caused by socioeconomic inequality. Hence my argument that health inequity and social determinants of health are not footnotes to the future of public health. They have to be right at the center of the future of public health. <clears throat> if we look at diabetes in Buenos Aires by education, secondary or incomplete education, incomplete tertiary or university, and people who completed tertiary or university education, this dramatic social gradient for men and for women in diabetes, and something similar, but not quite as clear, for monthly income. All through Latin America, all through middle income and even low income countries, we see the social gradient in health. We see it for under five mortality, 
which of course has much to do with infectious disease, but we see it for cardiovascular disease, we see it for diabetes, we see it, in other words, for major non-communicable diseases. We have to put action on the social determinants of health in a global context. Demographic change, the growth of the elderly population, increasing urbanization, climate change, which means we have to be sensitive to the environmental effects of our development policies, the nutrition transition, as we go from undernutrition to overnutrition in country after country, the epidemiological transition, the shift from communicable to non-communicable disease, and of course the global financial crisis. These all set the context for the actions that we need to take. The report of the Commission on Social Determinants of Health, which we called Closing the Gap in a Generation, was presented to the World Health Organization in 2008. And we said right at the heart of what we were trying to do was social justice. People put the argument that they're good economic reasons for addressing health inequalities, and that may well be the case. But that was not why we were engaged. We were engaged because we said avoiding avoidable health inequalities, promoting health equity is a matter of social justice. And we put at the heart empowerment of individuals, of communities, and indeed of whole countries. We said we need to create the conditions for people to take control of their lives. We had three principles of action, addressing the conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age. The structural drivers of those conditions at global, national, and local level, and the importance of monitoring, training, and research. And in the conditions of daily life, we looked at equity from the start, healthy places, fair employment, social protection, and universal health care. And in the structural drivers, we put great emphasis on health equity in all policies. As I said at the beginning, explaining my title, Fair Society, Healthy Lives, if we put fairness at the heart of all policy making, health would improve and health inequalities would diminish. It also includes good global governance, gender equity, political empowerment, market responsibility, and fair financing. And that means that every sector is a health sector. It doesn't mean that doctors should be taking over. It means that we need to look at the health and the health equity consequences of decisions taken in environment, in education, in transport, in finance, in social protection, because they all have important impacts on health and health equity. Let me show you an example of empowerment in action. These data come from British Columbia in Canada. Our Canadian colleagues have presented them and look at adolescent suicide rates in First Nation communities. Communities were classified <coughs> according to cultural factors, degree of participation in self-government or land claim participation, and the degree of community control of health services, education, cultural facilities, and police and fire services. So this is the number out of six of those cultural and community control factors present. And this is the adolescent suicide rate. The more empowered the community, the less likely are young people to kill themselves. This is empowerment in action. An important question when you publish something like the report of the Commission on Social Determinants of Health, 
is whether anybody is listening. And in the case of the Commission on Social Determinants of Health, that's particularly appropriate because our global reach meant that it was extraordinarily difficult to formulate recommendations that would be applicable in 192 member states of the World Health Organization. We tried to make a virtue of necessity and said that it was very important for countries to take the report of the Commission and translate it into their own context. Brazil set up its own Commission on Social Determinants of Health. President Lula holding the report of the Brazilian Commission. And this has continued under the new presidency of Dilma. I had the honor to hand a copy of our report to the Indian Prime Minister, Manmohan Singh. I was in India just over a month ago. And there are encouraging signs that this is now on the agenda of Indian policy making. The president of Costa Rica told me that she would make this a priority for her government and indeed to set up a mechanism for translating the recommendations of the commission into a form that would be suitable for Costa Rica. And in Peru, the mayor of Lima, making me a uh, uh, presenting me with the Medal of Lima, said that she wanted to make this a priority for her governance of the city of Lima. The Economic and Social Council of the United Nations debated the report of the Commission on Social Determinants of Health. And this statement comes not from me, not from the Commission, but from the Secretary General, from Ban Ki-moon. He said, most of the inequities we see is attributable to the conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work and age. A direct quote from the Commission on Social Determinants of Health. The fact that ECOSOC is discussing this does not by any means mean that specific action will happen. But it does mean it's on the agenda. It's part of the discourse. It's being discussed. Translating the findings into country context. As I mentioned at the beginning, the British government asked, what does the report of the commission mean to us? How could we use the findings of the global commission to develop new policies to reduce avoidable health inequalities in England. And so they invited me to conduct a review. And I published that in 2010, and we called it Fair Society, Healthy Lives. Each year so far, for the last two years, in 2011 and this year in 2012, on the one year anniversary of the publication of the English Review, we've published a set of data for every local area in England monitoring what's happened on three social determinants, early child development, the proportion of young people not in education, employment or training, and an adult poverty measure, and on two health measures, life expectancy and disability-free life expectancy. So it's a way of keeping it on the agenda, making it visible, saying what's happening to, to inequity in social determinants and in health. And in the light of these two reviews, the regional director of WHO for Europe, Dr. Susanne Jakob, invited me to conduct a review of social determinants and the health divide in Europe. And we will report that review in September 2012. Now, in the English review, we had six domains of recommendations give every child the best start in life, education and lifelong learning, employment and working conditions, minimum income for healthy living. The fifth was healthy and sustainable places and communities. And the sixth was a social determinants approach to prevention. 
Let me show you and put some emphasis on giving every child the best start in life. These are data from the 1970 British birth cohort in England. They look at cognitive development at 22 months of age and follow these children to 10 years of age. Now look first at children who at 22 months were in the 10th centile of cognitive development. If they grew up in families of low socioeconomic status, they remain low. There's some regression to the mean, but that need not detain us. If they grew up in families of high socioeconomic status, they catch up. Now, look at children who at 22 months of age were in the 90th centile. If they grew up in families of high socioeconomic status, they remain high. But if they grew up in families of low socioeconomic status, their relative scores on cognitive development decline. Assume for a moment that all the differences at 22 months are biologically determined and that those associated with family of upbringing are socially determined. You can see that the social trumps the biological. Now, of course, not all the differences at 22 months are biologically determined. <clears throat> the quality of early rearing really matters. Why am I showing you this? Because what happens in early childhood affects what happens in the education system. That, in turn, determines what sort of job you get, what your income is, where you live, and that, in turn, of course, has a profound impact on health and health inequalities. So can we do anything about these early child development scores? Yeah, we probably can. That's what the evidence shows. As one indicator of parental input, look at reading to children every day. It follows a social gradient. In the Millennium Cohort, a birth cohort in England, You can see the proportion who read to every day. It was probably under 40% for those in the lowest socioeconomic status quintile and over 75% for those in the highest. And it was a gradient. Regular bedtimes. And then look at mothers suffering postnatal depression, which follows the gradient the other way with catastrophic effects on children's social, emotional, psychological development. ensure a healthy standard of living for all. Now, as I've already shown you, the tax and benefit system is all obviously going to impact enormously on the ability of a society to ensure a healthy standard of living for everybody. And we see a, a minimum income standard as not just foods, clothes and shelter, important as they are, but sufficient resources to participate in society and to maintain human dignity. So turning attention from Britain to Latin America and the Caribbean, there are deep-rooted inequalities, but a strong tradition of social medicine. And what I detect is a commitment to action on the social determinants of health. If we look at urban income inequalities in, in selected countries in Latin America and the Caribbean, the Gini coefficient, which is a measure of income inequality, and you see these huge differences. Costa Rica, which has remarkably good health, relatively low, although increasing Gini coefficient. Brazil, huge and this range of countries. Policies can make a big difference to the magnitude of urban income inequalities and to the consequences. 
Look at the prevalence of stunting by family income in Brazil. 1974-75, family income quintiles, a steep social gradient in stunting. 1989, the gradient shallower. 1996, shallower still. And 2006, there's still a gradient, but it's barely detectable. We do know that income inequalities have come down in Brazil, so that's very important. And has to be one major plank of trying to reduce inequalities in health. But secondly, we need to break the link between being low on the income scale and having poor health outcomes. So reduce social and economic inequalities and break the link between social and economic position and poor health outcomes. And it seems to me likely that Brazil's done some of both of those. Breaking the link then, look at enrollment in preschool ages three to five and reading in sixth grade in selected countries in Latin America. You can see that preschool enrollment and reading in sixth grade go very closely together. So Cuba, Costa Rica, which have high levels of children in preschool score very well on reading in sixth grade. Paraguay, which has low preschool enrollment, children do much worse in sixth grade reading scores and in the Dominican Republic. Peru looks more to the lower end of the scale than it does to the higher. Investment in preschool education is key to children benefiting from the education system. And if we look at adult and youth literacy rates, once again, is Cuba up at the top, Chile, Uruguay, Argentina, Costa Rica. And we come down to Colombia, Mexico, Brazil, Peru, and down to Guatemala. There's been great improvement in literacy in Latin America in general but you can see there are still significant defects that need to be overcome. And it starts with the beginning of the life course. If we look at the ratio of income and completed secondary school between women and men in Latin America, so not just now economic, but uh, gender and economic inequalities. So the gender income ratio women earn about 70% of what men do in Colombia. In Colombia, the women actually do better in terms of completing secondary school than the men, as they do in many countries. But you can see in general, in general, these huge persisting gender inequities in income and gender inequities persisting in completion of secondary school. Homicide is, of course, of huge concern in Latin America. These are homicide rates per 100,000 population by region and sub-region. Southern Africa is the highest, then Central America then South America, then Western, Central Africa, and other regions, Europe, Western, Central Europe. Huge differences in homicide rates. Can we do anything about it? Well, yeah, we could a bit. We know that there are determinants of violence, economic and horizontal, between group inequality, make a big difference, unemployment, rapid unregulated urbanization. Look at the effect of fiscal policy on income inequality. 
in all of these countries, taxes and transfers, and I showed you earlier the taxes didn't make much difference in the United Kingdom, but transfers make a huge difference. So in all of these European countries, taxes and transfers make a huge difference to the Gini coefficient, big drop. So that's before taxes and transfers, after taxes and transfers. Peru, Mexico, Colombia, Chile, Brazil, Argentina, very little effect of taxes and transfers on income distribution. We know income inequalities related to homicide rates have a fiscal system that has a big impact on income inequality and the prediction is the homicide rates would go down. And one of the problems with big income inequalities is they damage social capital. One way of measuring social capital is trust. Another way is community participation. And metropolitan areas, small cities, and rural areas are listed here for different countries. And this is the net percent trust. And you can see in metropolitan areas a high degree of negative trust, of mistrust in these different countries. And although there is community participation, it is at a fairly low level. Income inequality damages social capital, trust, and community participation. When we were doing the English Review, we participated actively in development of policies in a, in a number of areas of England. One was the Northwest region, which contains Liverpool. Some of you may know it has two famous football clubs, Liverpool and Everton. But apart from that, it's a very deprived area of England. And I met many civil society groups in Liverpool and after one such meeting, I'd given a lecture, and these groups came back and fed back their thinking. And this is my summary of their thinking. The first was, they said, we do not want an outside expert, such as you, telling us what to do. Our values should shape our goals. Secondly, they said, we came here thinking the problem was poor quality programs and services, but we realize it's the nature of society that has to change, not just the programs and services. Related to the first, what we need to measure relates to our goals of what we want to achieve. And when I put to them that they don't want outside experts telling them what to do, does that mean they don't want to look at the evidence? Well, this was a bit confronting. And they said, well, give us the evidence, but let us figure out how to apply it in our own way. In other words, the journey is important. Local ownership is important, not just the destination, although that's important. So local ownership and collaborative working. Empowerment, community control. And all of this is aimed at achieving what I think public health and the future of public health should be about, creating a world where social justice is taken seriously.